Today we're in the Psalms. We're in Psalm 37 and 38 as we continue our study in the book of Psalms. And I was figuring out that at our rate, at the rate that we're presently attacking the Psalms, I do believe Jesus will return before we get to Psalm 150. But as I was preparing and reading Psalm 37, I realized two things. One, it's just a beautiful psalm just to read, and two, it has 40 verses. And uh, I originally wanted to go into Psalm 39, but I know that I'm not going to be able to do that. So we'll look at Psalm 37 and 38 tonight as we continue our study in the Psalms. Let's begin reading together at verse 1 in Psalm 37. I'll read to verse 6, and we'll get into our study. Psalm 37, beginning at verse 1, reading to verse 6. The psalmist David writes, Do not fret because of evildoers, nor be envious of the workers of iniquity, for they shall soon be cut down like the grass and wither as the green herb. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and feed on His faithfulness. Delight yourself also in the Lord, and He shall give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust also in Him, and He shall bring it to pass. He shall bring forth your righteousness as the light, and your justice as the as the noonday. Now, I want you to notice how he begins this psalm. It's a very, very practical introduction. He simply says, don't fret because of evildoers, nor be envious of the workers of iniquity. Because it seems sometimes that those who don't have a fear of the Lord, it seems sometimes those who don't even have a religious faith uh, seem to get away with everything that they do. And they also sometimes can even appear to have a happy and more fulfilled life than, than many believers and perhaps even more fulfilled than, than we. I know that there are times that you might have a, a guy that you know in the neighborhood or a woman you might work with, and uh, you know that they don't have an interest in the Lord whatsoever. They're not interested in prayer, the church, or anything like that. And yet they'll come up and they'll share with you about the wonderful things that are going on in their life. How they recently returned from a, a trip to Europe or how their kid is on the honor roll once again and uh, they just bought a brand new car and and you're thinking in envious ways, you're thinking, man, you've been to, to Paris, France, and I've never even been to Paris, California, you know? Your kid's on the honor roll, you know, mine's on a most wanted list, you know? And you got a new car, my car's, you know, it just, it smokes every time I turn it on, and, and you can get envious of them and all. And this is a, a fairly common thing that you find uh, in the Psalms. It seems that sometimes people may, may get away with everything that they do and never even, even pay for the things that they've done. Uh, in the Psalms, uh, in Psalm 73, you see the same sentiment, Psalm 73, verses 3 through 5. The psalmist there says this. He said, I envied the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. They have no struggles. Their bodies are healthy and strong. They are free from the burdens common to man. They're not plagued by human ills. You know, they have good health insurance. They never get sick, and when they do, they're, they're able to see a doctor whenever they want to. And you can see that the psalmist here in Psalm 37 could uh, almost seem like he was uh, discouraged at the unfairness of it all. As a matter of fact, once again, the psalmist in Psalm 73, echoing this, uh, says to us in verses 12 through 14, these are the ungodly who are always at ease. They increase in riches. He goes on to say, Surely I have cleansed my heart in vain, washed my hands in innocence. For all day long I have been plagued and chastened every morning. They get away with everything, and it seems that my life is just miserable, and I'm never really satisfied with anything. But he goes on to say in verse 2 here in Psalm 37, They shall soon be cut down like the grass and wither as the green herb. What finally helps him to make sense is the reality of an eternal perspective. They ultimately will be judged. And I believe that believers are to keep all things in a proper perspective. Once again, turning to Psalm 73, reading verses 16 through 18, the psalmist said, I thought how to understand this. It was too painful for me until I went into the sanctuary of God. Then I understood their end. Surely you set them in slippery places. You cast them down. To destruction. It may seem that they're getting away with something, and sometimes it seems that they're getting away with terrible evil, and they don't seem to pay a price. But he's saying, no, 
He said, when I got into fellowship with God and began to adjust my perspective, and I began to look at things from an eternal perspective, I realized that even if they seem to get away with things here on earth, they ultimately will stand before the God who judges all people, and they will give an account of themselves to the Lord. I have to be honest with you. There are times when I can feel the same way. We hear of a young American, uh, 26 years old, young enough to be you know, one of my kids, because I have a daughter who's 26, a son who's 25, another son who's 23, and a daughter who's 20. And I hear of a young man who's going to try and make some money and do some work in Iraq. He gets taken hostage, and, and then he's brutally murdered. And I see the picture of his father, and my heart goes out to that dad because every dad in this room would have done the same thing. You see him collapsed on the ground with his son holding him in his arms as he's just gotten the news that his son has been beheaded in a brutal fashion. Well, the ones who are killing him are crying out, praise the Lord, Allah Akbar, you know, Allah be praised, Allah is great. You know, and it just tears your soul, it really does. It angers you and it breaks you. And you might say, are they going to get away with this, Lord? And we think, well, maybe we can get some of our recons to go in. Maybe some of the rangers, you know. We want to take revenge. Well, you know, sometimes people seem to get away with things. Sometimes the people who perpetrate like that never get judged this side of heaven. That's why you go to the sanctuary of your God and you understand their end. You go to church and you get an eternal perspective. And you realize that though they may seem to get away with things this side of eternity... When they stand before God, he's a righteous judge, and he's going to take care of business. And so the psalmist David is simply saying, don't be fretting because of evildoers. Don't be envious of the workers of iniquity. They shall soon be cut down like the grass and wither as a green herb. Now, in uh, Israel, as it is common here in Southern California, there can be scorching winds that come off the desert and dry everything up. You can have some beautiful plants that are lush and green, but when the Santa Ana winds come in, and it just takes a few days of that, everything just dries up. That's the point that he's making. It can be instant, and it will be complete. They shall be cut down like the grass. He goes on in verse 3 to say, Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and feed on His faithfulness. Delight yourself also in the Lord. He shall give you the desires of your heart. So instead of envying the prosperity of the wicked, we should simply trust in the Lord because He's the one who answers the prayer of our hearts. You see, the one trusting in the Lord will have righteous desires. And when you have righteous desires, your prayers will be heard. His desires are actually cultivated in your heart. So as you delight yourself in the Lord, you're going to be asking for the things that are pleasing to Him. And when you delight yourself in the Lord, the delight of your heart should be that you would know Him better and love Him better, serve Him more uh, faithfully and all. He says, so delight yourself in Him. And as you delight yourself in Him, the desire of your heart will be fulfilled. Commit your way to the Lord and trust also in Him, He says. He shall bring it to pass. He shall bring forth your righteousness as the light and your justice as the noonday. When he says, commit your way to the Lord, that word commit speaks of rolling something off onto something else. It speaks of throwing your ways on the Lord. When he says, commit your way to the Lord, in other words, it's you're committing your course of life. You're committing the direction of your life to the Lord. And as you commit yourself to Him, He directs your path because you trust in Him with all of your heart. In verse 6, continuing, he says, "...she shall bring forth your righteousness as the light." your justice as the noon day. In other words, ultimately, God is going to be the one who vindicates you. Even if the evil speak poorly of you, even if people are gossiping about you, the Lord is going to vindicate you. In 1 Corinthians, in chapter 4, verse 5, Paul put it like this. He said, Judge nothing before the time until the Lord comes, who will both bring to light the hidden things of darkness and reveal the counsels of the hearts, and then each one's praise will come from God. He goes on in verse 7 to say, uh, Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for Him. Do not fret because of Him who prospers in His way, 
because of the man who brings wicked schemes to pass. Cease from anger. Forsake wrath. Do not fret. It only causes harm. So we can be internally agitated because someone seems to be getting away with something. We can wonder why the Lord doesn't act to vindicate us. And that can lead us to bitterness and a desire to take things into our own hands. But David says, if you just wait on the Lord, God has a way of taking care of business. Just allow the Lord some time to work, and He will take care of it. For evildoers shall be cut off, but those who wait on the Lord, they shall inherit the earth. For yet a little while, and the wicked shall be no more. Indeed, you will look diligently for his place, it shall be no more. The meek shall inherit the earth and shall delight themselves in the abundance of peace. Now, this is intended to remind us that the wicked will not last forever. Now, I've been living for a while now, and I've begun to see that that is true. When you're young, there may be a tyrant who is demonstrating uh, his evil towards people in the nation and all, and you see him seeming to get away with it for some time. You read of guys who, uh, who have uh, enslaved and destroyed lives. I think of Mao from uh, China and all that he did with the Red Guard and, and all that he did against the church in China when he took over and established a communist government. And yet, you know, he's a man and he ultimately is going to die and that's the way it is. You can live 80 years, 90 years, but ultimately you die. They will be cut off is what he's saying. But for, on the other hand, the person who loves the Lord will be blessed by God. God will work in their life and bless them. As a matter of fact, notice with me here in verse 9, he says that uh, those who wait on the Lord shall inherit the earth. Notice verse 11, the meek shall inherit the earth. And so he's saying that, uh, that we're going to be having blessings from the Lord. Now, obviously, this is speaking concerning the nation of Israel. And you need to keep in mind that the nation of Israel had a, an association of God's blessing with uh, his promised land. But Jesus also spoke concerning the meek inheriting the earth. Jesus in Matthew chapter 5, verse 5 said, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. The word inherit means to receive your portion. It speaks of receiving what is your rightful inheritance. And this is a common phrase. That this is speaking about the spiritual good that comes through meekness. And it speaks also about a, a, a future blessing that God will give to you and a present blessing that He gives. You see, when you're looking for heaven as your final home, earth loses its grip on your heart. And being detached from the world system, you are free to use it. So God begins to bless you, and you begin to see how God moves in your life. And so all things become yours in the sense that, that you're able to receive from God here, and you have an anticipation of things in the future. And so God wants to bless your life. The evildoers, on the other hand, they're going to be cut off. Verse 12 says, the wicked plots against the just, gnashes at him with his teeth, and the Lord laughs at him, for he sees that his day is coming. The wicked have drawn the sword and have bent their bow to cast down the poor and needy, to slay those who are of upright conduct. Their sword shall enter their own heart, their bows shall be broken. And so those who do not fear the Lord oppose those who do fear the Lord, and they intend to cause harm to the righteous, and they bully people. But God's going to deal with them. Their own plots will eventually ensnare them. They're going to reap what they sow. They're going to dig a pit, and they're going to fall into it. They're going to push a stone, and the stone is going to roll over on them. Their sword shall enter their own heart. Their plots are not going to be successful. Verse 16, a little that a righteous man has is better than the riches of many wicked. For the arms of the wicked shall be broken, but the Lord upholds the righteous. The Lord knows the days of the upright, and their inheritance shall be forever. They shall not be ashamed in the evil time. In the days of famine they shall be satisfied. But the wicked shall perish, and the enemies of the Lord, like the splendor of the meadows, shall vanish into smoke. They shall vanish away. And so the little that a righteous man has is better than the riches of, of uh, many wicked. It's better to have a little with the fear of the Lord than great treasure with trouble, the Proverbs tells us. In Proverbs 28, 6, it says, Better a poor man who walks in blameless, uh, whose walk is blameless than a rich man whose ways are perverse. The Lord has a way of blessing us if we just enjoy the things that He gives to us rather than trying to be envious of the rich and wanting to have the things that they have. The Bible tells us here in verses 18 through 20 that the Lord knows the, the days of the upright and their inheritance shall be forever. God protects those who love Him, but the wicked shall perish. Notice he says they're like grass and they're like smoke. They're here for a moment and gone in an instant. And that's absolutely true. 
The wicked borrows and does not repay, but the righteous shows mercy and gives. For those who are blessed by him shall inherit the earth, but those who are cursed by him shall be cut off. The wicked are selfish. They pursue what benefits them first and most. They keep, as a matter of fact, the things that they have borrowed from other people. On the other hand, the righteous mercifully cares for others and is rewarded by God. If you take notes, Proverbs 19.17 is a great, great proverb. It says, He who has pity on the poor lends to the Lord, and he will pay back what he has given. The wicked, they're selfish. They'll say, can I borrow a few bucks? And they never give it, give it back. They never pay it back. But on the other hand, the righteous are merciful and generous. It has always been the mark of a genuine person of faith to have mercy and generosity. That's just a mark of a genuine believer, to be merciful and generous. And the reason that you're merciful and generous is very simple. God has been merciful to you and generous with you. Now, an unrighteous man is always trying to accrue, always trying to take for himself, always trying to build up his bank account. But a righteous man knows that as he gives, he's actually given to the Lord. And as he gives to the Lord, God has a way of paying him back in a variety of ways. And that's an act of faith. When it says in verse 23, the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delights in his way. Though he fall, he shall not be utterly cast down, for the Lord upholds him with his hand. When it says the steps are ordered, that word ordered speaks about being established or made stable or secured. The steps of a righteous man are secured or established or made stable. This is one of the scriptures that, that I have had in my heart for a long time. The steps of a righteous man, actually, a good man, are ordered by the Lord. He delights in his way. God has a way of leading you in the direction he wants you to go. What you need to do, what I need to do, is we need to pray that God will reveal his direction to us. And God does that, and he does that through prayer and the word of God, and sometimes through the counsel of some friends who love the Lord, righteous counsel. And there are things that sometimes you may not be sure about, so you ask a friend, can you pray for me? I'm seeking the Lord in a direction as to where I'm supposed to go. Now, God has intended for you to do certain things. He has works that are established beforehand for you, that you might be able to do in order to bring praise and glory to Him. But it's an amazing thing how He leads you, and He normally doesn't give to you all the information at one time. You see, I enjoy where I am right now. I like the place I am in the Lord right now. I'm enjoying my, my spiritual life right now. But if, I, if, I, if the Lord had told me when I got saved, oh, by the way, uh, over the course of the next X amount of years, you're going to go through a variety of things. Some of those things are going to take the wind out of you. Some of the things are going to just cause you great depression and great sorrow. Uh, do you want to take the journey? I probably would have said no. I'd have probably said, you know, it's cool. You know, I'm fine as I am. But the Lord has a way of taking you step by step through the journey. You turn around and look back and see all the places that you've been, and you're amazed at how God has been faithful uh, to you and, and through you all those steps. And then you arrive in that location that he wants you to be, and you blow your mind, and you say, how did we even get here in the first place? It's because the Lord ordered your steps. He established, founded, and directed you to go in the direction he wanted you to go. So I was 23 years old once. It's been a while. And um, I got out of the military. I got a job. I was working for a, for a company uh, delivering batteries. And uh, I was working out of Whittier, living in Norwalk. And I went to work one day. I can still remember it. I got in my little delivery truck. And I drove out into this area here, right off of Reservoir. And I went to FMC. There's a company out there, FMC. And I made a delivery. And I can still remember as I was driving, growing up in Norwalk and working in Whittier, driving out here was like, man, I'm going to the other side of the world. You know what I'm saying? It was the other side of the world, you know. And I can still remember rolling off the freeway and, and just, you know, making the delivery, going in there and, and dropping off those batteries and all. I didn't realize that uh, just a few years from then, I'd begin working at FMC. 
I never realized that I would be living in this area because being L.A. County, I, I basically believed that I was going to live in L.A. most or the rest of my life. I, you know, if I was going to move anywhere, it wasn't going to be into San Bernardino County. If I moved anywhere, it would be anywhere but San Bernardino County. I would have moved to San Luis Obispo or somewhere up the central coast, but there's no way you know, that you would get me into Chino or Ontario. I mean, the wages of sin is Chino. I mean, you don't, you don't volunteer to go there. And yet, in the course of all of that, you know, I'm doing a Bible study in Norwalk, and, and, uh, and my brother Frank, who lives in Ontario, gets saved and needs to be discipled. And so my sister and I begin to drive from Norwalk here to, uh, to the city of Ontario and right off of D Street and and, uh, and, and, and I'd, I'd go there and off of San Antonio and D Street by the park. And some of you know where that is. And, and I would go there in these little apartments. And every Monday night, I would teach my brother a Bible study. He begins to invite friends. Eventually, Marie uh, Lopez shows up. Marie gets saved in my Bible study. Uh, we begin to date. Eventually, uh, I'm, I move out here. I'm going to school and I'm working. And, and I move out here just down the street, you know, about half a mile, just up the road here in Philadelphia. There's this little rock house there. And I used to live in that house. Not a rock house. It was made of rock. <laughs> I should clarify that. Some of you heads are going, yeah, man, I know that rock house. No, no. It was a house <laughs> made out of stone. That's another word you don't need to hear, stone. It's just a house. You know, I, lived, I just lived in a house down there. <laughs> and, and we would drive by here, and we would see this, this church. Marie and I were dating, and I would walk by and see the church building right over here. And, and I said, that would be a great place for, you know, I like that little church. Little did I know that the Lord would eventually bring us to not only be married and to live in this area, but to occupy the property that I would drive by regularly looking at saying, boy, I really like that little church. The steps of a righteous man, the steps of a good man are ordered of the Lord. God will, will establish you, strengthen you, direct you. All you need to do is just say like Isaiah, here am I, Lord, send me. I just want to be used. And God will say, fine, can you take one step? And you say, yes, you take that one step of faith. Then you take a second step, and it just begins that way through a lifetime. And then eventually, you, you find yourself looking back saying, so that's how you planned it out for me all this time. So the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delights in his way. God will bless you every step of the way. Though he fall, he shall not be utterly cast down, for the Lord upholds him in his hand. On that journey in the Lord, there are times that you will not live a perfect life. It's like, like every day. You're going to fail in, in thought, word, or deed. You're not going to be the perfect person you want. You will stumble. But even though you stumble, the Lord still sustains you and holds you up. And you continue in that journey until you ultimately reach the goal that the Lord has prepared for you. He says in verse 25, I've been young and now I'm old. Yet I have not seen the righteous forsaken, nor his descendants begging bread. He is ever merciful and lends, and his descendants are blessed. And though we do go through adversity, he's saying, God is faithful to care for our every need because God does not forsake his own children. And God will always take care of you. He loves you. So my daughter this morning, my Anna, walks up to, my, <laughs> walks up to Marie, my wife, and it's funny, I don't know if your kids do anything like this, those of you who are parents. I don't know if your kids do this or not. But I see Anna walk up to Marie, and she's whispering. She's whispering. And, and Marie's looking at her, and, and so I said, so what? What do you need? What do you need, honey? She goes, well, I said, what are you whispering about? I know. What are you asking for? She turns and looks at me. She goes, well, Dad, she says, I ran a little short this, this week. And uh, I need some money for, for lunch. And I looked at her and I said, you know, you and I are going to have to do, we're going to have to have a talk about budgeting. <laughs> but we won't have it right now, will we? I said, you need to talk about budgeting, baby doll, because you should be able to take care of your own needs. I said, but uh, are you thinking I won't give you anything so you're talking to your mom like she will? And she smiles at me, and she goes, no, Dad, I was just asking. I said, no, no, don't lie to me. Look, if you need some money, <laughs> I'll give it to you. 
And I said, you know why I'll give it to you? I said, I'll give it to you because I love you, because you're my little girl, and I want you to eat. Now, if I, being an evil father, <laughs> will take care of the needs of my daughter, why can't my heavenly father take care of my needs? I'm evil, and he's not. I lecture. That, you know, she told me the other day, she said, Dad, I wish you'd have spanked me. I've never spanked her in her life. Never. I lectured her. And she said, I would have just as soon a beating than one of your lectures, you know. <laughs> and I, being evil, know how to bless my children when they're in need. How much more so will the Lord take care of us when we're in need? And that's the point. He does take care of us. He does bless us. And He will, he will care for us. Verse 27, depart from evil and do good. Dwell forever. For the Lord loves justice and does not forsake His saints. They're preserved forever. But the descendants of the wicked shall be cut off. The righteous shall inherit the land and dwell forever. And so God will care for you. But notice with me, he says, but you are to depart from evil and do good. So God cares for you, but you need to depart from evil. He will bless you, and he will bless your children, but he also will judge the evil and judges their children. This is really a way of him saying, so be careful to bring up your children in the fear of the Lord. In verse 30, the mouth of the righteous speaks wisdom, and his tongue talks of justice. The law of his God is in his heart. None of his steps shall slide. So righteousness begins in the heart and is worked out in your life. The psalmist uh, in Psalm 40, and we'll see this in a while, Psalm 40 verse 8 says, I delight to do your will, O my God. Your law is within my heart. It begins in the inner person and works it, its way out. And that's the point he's making here. Verse 32, the wicked watches the righteous and seeks to slay him. The Lord will not leave him in his hand nor condemn him when he is judged. Wait on the Lord and keep his way, and he shall exalt you to inherit the land. When the wicked are cut off, you shall see it. I have seen the wicked in great power and spreading himself like a native green tree. Yet he passed away, and behold, he was no more. Indeed, I sought him, but he could not be found. And so he points out that the wicked, in verse 32 and 33, watch over the righteous and seek to slay him. In other words, righteous people are often persecuted. And though the wicked may seem to triumph, ultimately they will stand before the Lord. And one of the, one of the uh, promises that we have in Scripture is those who live godly shall suffer persecution, and that's absolute truth. There's no doubt about that. And there is, I believe, a, uh, a real rejection of the Christian faith here in the United States, and it's a very obvious one, at least for those of us who are born again, and we note that indeed it is a very obvious rejection of the Christian faith. And there is a persecution that takes place. In the United States, it's not always physical. As a matter of fact, infrequently it is. But there is a bias against our faith. There is a bias against our belief. And sometimes people believe that they're going to get away with rejecting the Lord. And the point he's making is that's not true whatsoever. When he says in verse 34, to wait on the Lord and keep his way, he'll exalt you. The wicked, again, do not last forever. They grow old and ultimately they die. Verse 37, mark the blameless man and observe the upright. For the future of that man is peace. But the transgressors shall be destroyed together. The future of the wicked shall be cut off. But the salvation of the righteous is from the Lord. He is their strength in the time of trouble. And the Lord shall help them and deliver them. He shall deliver them from the wicked and save them because they trust in Him. So if you're going to be using anybody as a role model in your life, use a godly person. Look to see if there's somebody that loves the Lord and is blessed by God and use them as your role model. And today we have an absence of heroes, and so we try to find some or even create some. We invent heroes. But I really believe that as a father, that one of the roles that God gave to me is to be my child's hero, the way that my dad was my hero. I looked up to him. He was a man of integrity. He was a good man, loved my mom. He was an honest man. He was a hardworking man. He was the kind of man that, that I wanted to be like. He was much beyond me. My dad was strong, and his character was, was great. 
And as a child, I grew up, and I was basically in awe of him. I looked at him as if he was a giant amongst men, but my father was only five foot seven. He was a little guy, but he was the greatest, strongest man that I ever met. I had this faith and love uh, towards my dad. He was my hero. And when I began to have children, I thought, wouldn't that be a good thing if in the absence of heroes that we have here in this world, I could become the person that they want to be like the most? And I really believe that you ought to be that way too. You ought to have friends around you who, though they don't ever say this to you, admire you so much that they'll say, I like your patience, I like your gentleness, I like your goodness, I, I like your meekness, I like the way you're expressive, I like the fact that you have passion, I like your purity, I like the fact that even when you get angry, I never hear a foul word come out of your mouth. I like to see the way you treat your family. I like to see how faithful you are to God. I like the way you are. And when you see somebody like that, then you begin to pray and say, Lord, there are qualities in somebody's life that I would like to have for myself. I have my pastor, Chuck, for example, and I look at him, and, I, and I've asked the Lord, God, give me a gracious spirit like, like he has. I see Mike McIntosh, and I say, Lord, that man has a tremendous vision. He has such great faith. Lord, I would love to have that kind of strength and faith. I see Greg Laurie, and I say, Lord, that man has a very clear way of presenting the gospel, very, very simple but very profound. I would love to be like that. Or, Lord, you see, Raul, make me nothing like him. <laughs> nothing. Nothing at all. Oh, well, I was going to tell you something, but I won't. But you know what I'm saying. You ought to mark the righteous man, note him, and say, this man is blessed. What is it about you? What is it about you that puts you in the position of being blessed? Because that's what I want for my life too. I want to be blessed just like that. So mark the blameless man. Notice that. And finally in verse 39 and 40, he says, salvation of the righteous is from the Lord. He is their strength in the midst of trouble. The bottom line is God is our salvation and we trust in Him and in doing so we will not be afraid because the Lord is our strength and the Lord is our song and He is our salvation. He delivers those from the wicked and saves them. Now Psalm 38, continuing in our study, another Psalm of David, begins in verse 1 by saying, O Lord, do not rebuke me in your wrath nor chasten me in your hot displeasure. For your arrows pierce me deeply, and your hand presses me down. There's no soundness in my flesh because of your anger, nor is there any health in my bones because of my sin. For my iniquities have gone over my head like a heavy burden. They are too heavy for me. My wounds are foul and festering because of my foolishness. I'm greatly troubled. I'm bowed down greatly. I go mourning all day long. For my loins are full of inflammation. There's no soundness in my flesh. I'm feeble and severely broken. I groan because of the turmoil of my heart. Lord, all my desire is before you, and my sign is not hidden from you. My heart pants. My strength fails me. As for the light of my eyes, it also has gone from me. My loved ones and my friends stand aloof from my plague, and my kinsmen stand afar off. Those also who seek my life lay snares for me. Those who seek my hurt speak of destruction and plan deception all the day long. But I... Like a deaf man, do not hear. And I am like a mute who does not open his mouth. Thus I am like a man who does not hear and in whose mouth is no response. For in you, O Lord, I hope. You will hear, O Lord, my God. For I said, hear me, lest they rejoice over me. Lest when my foot slips, they magnify themselves against me. For I am ready to fall. My sorrow is continually before me. For I will declare my iniquity. I will be in anguish over my sin. But my enemies are vigorous and they're strong, and those who hate me wrongfully have multiplied. Those also who render evil for good, they are my adversaries because I follow what is good. Do not forsake me, O Lord, O my God, be not far from me. Make haste to help me, O Lord, my salvation. Nice little upbeat psalm. In verses 1 and 2, notice how he says, I am undergoing a time of chastening from you. That's what he says when he says, Do not rebuke me in your wrath, nor chasten me in your hot displeasure. So I'm going through a time that is severe. I am experiencing tremendous anguish. 
He says in verse 3, there is no soundness in my flesh because of your anger, nor is there any health in my bones because of my sin. My iniquities have gone over my head like a heavy burden. They're too heavy for me. My wounds are foul festering because of my foolishness. I'm drowning in affliction is what he's saying. I'm overwhelmed by my guilt. Lord, I just can't, I, I can't get my head above water right now. It seems like everything that, 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 that is afflicting me is pressing me down. And I can't stand this. It's like I'm drowning in this. But I want to say something quickly here. Uh, this being burdened like this actually makes him a candidate for God to deliver him. Um, Jesus in, in Matthew chapter 11, verse 28 said, Come unto me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, I will give you rest. You see, as I was going through this psalm, I realized that David was going through a very serious time, a great time of pressure and affliction. And, and yet at the same time realized that that places him in a position for God to deliver him. Because as he's going through this time of groaning, like he says in verse 4, this heavy burden that's too heavy, these wounds that are foul and festering, because of his foolishness, because of the sin, iniquity, and all that he regards himself as doing was just foolish, that places him in a position to ask God for help. When he says, I'm troubled, I am bowed down greatly, I go mourning all the day long, my loins are full of inflammation, there's no soundness in my flesh, I'm feeble and severely broken, I groan because of the turmoil in my heart. Lord, all my desires before you, my sign is not hidden from you. My heart pants, my strength fails me. As for the light of my eyes, it also is gone from me. He's describing what it's like to go under a, tre- a tremendous affliction. He even speaks about this burning pain in his abdomen. He's speaking of his health. His spirit are drying up as his heart is in turmoil. And he knows that God sees all of this, and he knows that God sees that he's, he's mourning. But as he's doing so, he's saying, Lord, I'm drying up, I'm withering. It's like I've got no life in me at all. Now, what takes place? Well, verse 11, my loved ones and friends stand aloof from my plague. My kinsmen stand afar off. Lord, I'm isolated right now. It feels like there's nobody who's around me. Those, those who love me the most uh, have separated from me, and it's because of my sin. My, sep- my sin has separated me from my friends and my family. Let me say something very practical to you that some of you might understand. And I want you to see this. In verse 11, My loved ones and my friends stand aloof from my plague and my kinsmen stand afar off. Listen, there are times, there are times when I've had a friend who has not been walking right with the Lord and they don't want to hear it. They don't want to hear it. They don't want to hear that what they're doing is wrong. And so, if I have shared with them and I have said, and man, I have to tell you the way, for me it's never easy. It's never been easy to tell a friend that there's an area of their life that is sinful. Listen, there are areas of people's lives that are just who they are, but they're not sinful. They're just areas of who they are. And you make adjustments to that. But there are times when the same friend is blowing it. And you know it. And they're making bad decisions, and you know it. And they want your approval. They want you to bless them. You, they want you to agree with them. They, they, they want you to say, hey, it's cool. God's going to still bless you. And you can't. Because you know what they're doing is wrong. And so what happens is is there's a conflict. Sin makes separation. Never forget that. And there begins to be a conflict in the relationship. And because sin makes a separation, your friends may, you may say, my friends are aloof. My friends are, are not close to me like they used to be. What's going on? Sometimes the awkwardness of, of the sin that you're involved in, well, you, you can't rejoice over that. You, you, you know, as a friend, I can't say, oh, that's great what you're doing. How can I make that practical? I've had people say to me, my girlfriend's pregnant. Praise the Lord, isn't that wonderful? Well, I understand something about that. 
But is that great? No. No, that's not great. That's sad that you didn't love your girl enough to marry her before you became pregnant with her. Am I supposed to rejoice with you? Because let me tell you something. What you did was wrong. Do you want to know something? This generation doesn't want to hear that. We have had people in our own fellowship who will introduce each other as husband and wife and you find out later on that they're not husband and wife, they're living together. They just call themselves husband and wife. We have people today in our society who call the person they're living with their, their, their fiancé. Now it's a fiancé. I think fiancé means my shack up. I'm not sure. It's the one I'm shacking with, my fiancé. It's French for shack up. But they call them fiancé, which they think legitimizes their fornication. It legitimizes it because, after all, we will get married eventually. And see, what happens is that puts a real strain in relationship. It absolutely does. As a father, if my daughter comes home with a guy that I don't approve of, and I see that in that relationship it is not healthy, I'm not going to put my hand a blessing on them and say, oh, this is a great relationship. And there will be a distance that develops between my daughter and me over that relationship. There will be. There's no doubt about it, because I'm not the kind of father who can close my eyes to those kinds of things. And my daughters will know for sure. And I have told my daughters, as well as my sons, I've said, listen, if you ever make a decision to get married to somebody that the, the Spirit of the Lord, and I, just, I just don't bear witness with that, that relationship, uh, and this may sound harsh to some of you, but it's what I've told my own kids. I've said, I will go to your wedding and I'll be there with you, but I will not perform it. I will not perform it. I will not put my blessing on a relationship that I don't sense God's hand on. And you want to know something? Some people say, how can you do that? You're a pastor. You're... No, I'm a pastor, but I'm not a wedding chaplain. You know, this is Calvary Chapel, not Calvary Wedding Chapel. And so what I do is I try and live a right life with my family as well as my church, you see. And if they come home with somebody that, that I, I can't bear witness this is a good relationship, there will be a sense of isolation. There will be a disturbance in our relationship. And David's saying that the, the sin and my foolishness that I've been involved in has even caused my friends to be aloof from me. There's a separation that takes place in sin. And sometimes when people are in sin, they get mad at the people and say, you're judging me, you're not loving me. That very often is the result of the fact that that, that person's in sin, unrepentant, and in doing so has actually driven a wedge between them. He says in verse 13, I'm like a deaf man. I like a deaf man do not hear. I'm like a mute who does not open his mouth. Thus I'm, I'm like a man who does not hear and whose mouth is no response. Uh, I'm totally isolated from everyone is what he's saying. I, I really have nothing that I can say. In verse 15 and 16, continuing, For in, in you, O Lord, I hope you will hear, O Lord my God. For I said, Hear me, lest they rejoice over me, lest when my foot slips they magnify themselves against me. I have no argument against my enemies. They desire my destruction. So my only hope and my only help is you. And that's why I'm saying, uh, Come to my aid. Help me. I'm ready to fall. My sorrow is continually before me. For I will declare my iniquity. I will be in anguish over my sin. But my enemies are vigorous and they're strong. And those who hate me wrongfully have multiplied. Those also who render evil for good, they are my adversaries because I follow what is good. God, he's saying, I am sorry. I am sorry for my sin. And God, I'm asking you to forgive me of my sin. That's what he says when he says, my sorrow is continually before me. I will declare my iniquity. I will be in anguish over my sin. You know, sometimes when you're in sin, as a matter of fact, every time you're in sin, when it finally dawns on you that that's what you're in, uh, there is a sense of anguish. There's a sense of anguish in your soul. And I think that's a good thing to have. There are people who say you should never have guilt. I think that sometimes there needs to be a sense that I have done wrong. That shows that you're alive. That shows that you have a conscience. There needs to be a sense of anguish sometimes in our life, especially when we have done wrong. And that's what David is saying here. 
He's saying, I'm sorry, Lord. I'm sorry for my sin, and I'm asking you, please, to forgive me. When he says, I will declare my iniquity, I'll be in anguish over my sin, I'm confessing my sin to you, and my heart is broken because of it. So he goes on to say, do not forsake me, O Lord. O my God, be not far from me. Make haste to help me, O Lord, my salvation. And so finally he's saying, I know that you will because you are my Savior. And in my knowledge that you are my salvation, I can ask you to forgive me. Now, the Bible in Psalm 34, 18 says, The Lord is near to those who have a broken heart, save such as have a contrite spirit. And so, Lord, I have done wrong. My enemy rejoices to see the pain that I'm in. My friends have become distant from me. I'm withering up inside, and I'm filled with pain. I have anguish of soul, anguish of spirit, and I'm even physically hurting. And so what I'm asking you to do is I'm asking you to forgive me of my sin. I'm asking you to restore me to a relationship with you, and I know you will because you are the God of my salvation. So this, in reality, is really, I think, a microscope looking into the heart of a man who's dealing with an area of his life. And as you look at this psalm, perhaps you can identify with it a bit too, because if you've ever gone through hard times because of your sin, then you can see the answer is simply what you see here, confessing, turning away from it, and re-embracing a relationship with the Lord and ultimately being able to say, you are the God of my salvation. You haven't forsaken me. You are with me. You do restore me. And in this I am grateful.